Trade was big, but war was bigger in certain periods. In 1756, William Smith writes in his diary, war is declared in England universal joy among the merchants. And why? Because in fact, New York City is the central base of operations by the British against their classic enemy, the French in North America and the Caribbean. What does this mean? This means that in 1758, there are 25,000 British troops and 14,000 Marines in North America, overwhelmingly based in New York City. This means all these people need food. They need clothing and uniforms. They need ship repairs. They need sex and R&R. &R. So the merchants are happy. The whores are happy. The innkeepers are happy. There is money pouring into the economy. Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin, with great envy, writes in 58, God, these merchants are cleaning up. So this is, in fact, a moment of maximum satisfaction with the empire by the biggest and most powerful merchants in New York City because the benefits of being on the right side of the British Navy uh, have never been more apparent. The trouble is with, with wars is peace uh, from the perspective of the war is good for business school. And in 1763, the British fleet sails away, the defense contracts peter out, and the city, in fact, falls into a depression. 1763 is hard times. All that money that was pouring in is not pouring in. Worse, the British now say, okay, you owe us, and we are now in a whole new universe, taxes and extraction of resources at the moment of maximum weakness in the economy. This is the background within which there is going to be the beginning of the road to revolution. If the interest of the mother country and her colonies cannot be made to coincide, then the connection between them ought to cease. The New York Gazette, 1765. It began in the spring of 1765, when England passed the Stamp Act. A tax on 43 kinds of business transactions, from legal contracts to liquor licenses. It threatened the very lifeblood of New York's vibrant merchant culture. There wasn't a person in America who wasn't mad at the Stamp Act because it attacked lawyers. It attacked sailors who would have to pay a tax every time they bought playing cards. It attacked brides-to-be who would have to pay when their marriage license was taken out. It attacked newspaper owners. So there's no question that New York City would have been a bizarre place indeed if there weren't as much hostility to the Stamp Act here as there were, were in Boston or in Philadelphia or for that matter in the countryside. On November 1st, 1765, the day the act was to take effect, an angry mob gathered on New York Commons, then marched down to the Bowling Green where they hanged and burnt an effigy of the royal governor, then set his carriage on fire. The Stamp Act was quickly repealed, and grateful New Yorkers soon erected a huge bronze statue of King George III to affirm their loyalty to the British crown. But their gratitude did not last long, as one intolerable act followed another, until the stage had been set for complete separation from the mother country. People have always come to cities to take on a new identity since the Middle Ages. Breathing the city air makes you free, they said in the Middle Ages. That's never been more true about a place like New York. People come here from all over the world, not just from the interior of the United States, from all over the world to make themselves up. If you want to be who you are, you stay where you are. If you want to be somebody else, if you want to be part of something new, you come to New York. That's been true, I think, through the life of the city. In June 1773, an illegitimate 16-year-old boy from the West Indian island of Nevis landed in the divided colony. Like a seed blown by happy chance onto perfect ground, one man later said, the young Alexander Hamilton arrived in New York on the eve of an extraordinary transformation. In the years to come, 
he would do everything in his power to hurry the city on toward its ultimate destiny. He is, after all, a bastard from the West Indies. He is the quintessential upstart. He's not born in America. He's got no long history. He's a New Yorker, very much a New Yorker. And his belief that anybody who had intelligence and ability, had a right to rise, is certainly very much the New York immigrant story. Hamilton threw himself almost immediately into the whirlwind of debate sweeping through the colony. In 1774, while still a sophomore at King's College, he published an incendiary pamphlet urging New Yorkers to defy the English Parliament and lay claim to their natural rights as free men. He was soon mesmerizing crowds on the New York Commons with his fiery political oratory. I think the image of Alexander Hamilton at the age of 17 being able to incite entire mobs of New Yorkers to rebel against the British crown, to me there is something so typically New York about that. I mean, here you have this guy who comes to probably the only place he could have come to in the United States and really made a name for himself. And immediately, through his own brilliance, but also because the city is so accepting, becomes this important political figure while he's still a teenager. Hamilton wanted that war badly, no matter what the issues were, because very early on he said, it is in war that a man makes his reputation. And it is in moments of flux and change that a man can rise. So unlike some of the established leader, political leaders of New York, he's certainly someone who wants to see the revolution come on no matter what. To the shock of most loyal New Yorkers, Hamilton's wish came true sooner than even he could have imagined. On Sunday, April 23rd, 1775, a frantic messenger came galloping into town down the post road from Boston. Blood had been shed at Lexington and Concord. The American Revolution had started. In New York, jubilant patriots immediately seized control of the Customs House and City Hall. Alexander Hamilton threw himself into the revolutionary fervor eventually rising to become one of George Washington's closest aides. But a cloud of gloom soon fell over the island city, as even the most ardent of patriots could see that Manhattan would be all but defenseless before the guns of the British Navy. Within days, a massive evacuation of New York had begun. In the next nine months, 80% of the city's population fled Manhattan. April 29th, 1775. The past week has been one of commotion and confusion. Fear and panic seized many of the people who prepared to move into the country. August 28th. Moving out of the city continues and some of the streets look plague-stricken, so many houses are closed. What Americans really don't realize is the pivotal role that uh, New York had in the American Revolution. Certainly the British realized it from the very beginning. And they looked at the map and they saw that New York is almost equidistant between the two most important colonies uh, in the New World, Massachusetts and Virginia. And indeed the British strategy was take New York City, have another force come down the Hudson River, split the colonies from the get-go and hopefully bring this uh, rebellion to a quick and happy conclusion from the point of view of the British Parliament. In the spring of 1776, General George Washington, the newly appointed commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, rushed his untrained troops to Manhattan, certain that the British would strike there first. Should they get New York and Commander the Hudson, they can stop the intercourse between northern and southern colonies, upon which depends the safety of America. George Washington. I feel for you, my New York friends, for I expect that your city will be laid to ashes. The American Mercury.
I was upstairs and spied as I peeped out the bay. Something resembling a wood of pine trees trimmed. I could not believe my eyes. I thought all London was afloat. Private Daniel McCurtain. On the morning of June 29th, 1776, New Yorkers awoke to an unforgettable sight. During the night, more than a hundred British warships had sailed into New York Harbor. In the weeks to come, nearly 500 English vessels carrying more than 32,000 British and Hessian soldiers and 10,000 sailors would drop anchor in the lower bay. It was the largest land sea expeditionary force mounted by Great Britain until the Normandy invasion during World War II. It took six weeks for the giant force to disembark and take up positions on Staten Island. You can imagine the farmer on Staten Island waking up one morning and seeing a harbor full of warships sailing in to realize that, oops, perhaps England is too mighty to have risen up in rebellion against her. Across the harbor, New York City braced for war. On July 9th, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was read aloud for the first time in Manhattan on the city commons. Afterwards, a cheering throng of soldiers and civilians marched down to the Bowling Green and pulled the statue of King George from its pedestal. The two tons of British lead were melted down and turned into 42,088 American bullets. George Washington, who was still learning about being a general in the summer of 1776, had a real challenge in front of him. He knew the importance of New York City strategically. He knew the British wanted to take it. His problem, though, is in order to defend Manhattan, the kind of bluffs of Brooklyn overlook it. Uh, if the British took the bluffs, then their guns and everything would be looking down on his city. So he needed to defend Brooklyn. The danger of defending Brooklyn is that Brooklyn is separated really from the mainland of the United States, and you're taking on the foremost maritime power on Earth. So George Washington took a gamble, moved his main forces to the Brooklyn side of the East River and the Upper Bay, and there confronted the British Army. On August 26, 1776, the battle for New York began when 20,000 British soldiers were ferried from Staten Island and began moving towards Washington's much smaller force, dug in south of Brooklyn Heights. For the Americans, it was a disaster from the start. In just two days, Washington lost almost 2,000 men, a quarter of his army. On the rain-soaked night of August 29th, 1776, with his shattered forces pinned against the East River, the American commander gambled everything on an extraordinary military maneuver. Commandeering every skiff and fishing boat he could lay his hands on, Washington tried to ferry his exhausted men across the East River to Manhattan. In total darkness, without a sound, in less than seven hours. It was dark and it was foggy when they evacuated 10, 12,000 of our troops, Washington's army, across the East River. Washington's army was saved that night. Imagine 10, 12,000 soldiers uh, making their way down to the river's edge in the dark to be rowed across in the fog on those big flat bottom boats, uh, knowing that uh, they could be caught at any moment, knowing they were in retreat and knowing that the British Army was uh, close on their heels and doing it all with perfect uh, discipline and surviving to fight another day. And it changed the course of history that night right there on the East River. Certain he could no longer defend the city, Washington retreated up the length of Manhattan, fighting bloody rearguard actions along a country lane that would one day be Upper Broadway. From his field headquarters in Upper Manhattan, he could just see the British flag flying over the city he could not save. 